Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I'm, I'm rather relieved to see some smiling faces. <laughs> it seems the most irreverent start to a sermon than I can remember doing for some considerable, considerable time. Um, and if you missed it, basically, um, try and find it on YouTube because it's a great clip. It's a really, really good clip. But it raises the question that I think is one of the key questions in this story of Jesus about the sheep and the goats. And is doing good for someone because it saves us from the consequences still a good thing? The people us saved the man by having a whip round so they could pay off his debt. But they did it so that he didn't take them with him when he jumped off the cliff, when he, when he went over the cliff. So it's my question, you know, it's a sort of interesting one. What is doing good and when is doing good really doing good? And when is it motivated by bad motives? And if it's motivated by bad motives, is it suddenly no longer good? See, you don't want to live in my head. But those are some of the questions that this story of Jesus actually raises. Now, remember, um, those of you that have been uh, keeping up with these teachings in, in Matthew and these talks that I've been giving will remember that so far Jesus's teaching focus has been on the religious people who are judged by God for thinking that their religious rule keeping has guaranteed them a place in the throne room of God's kingdom. Yet Jesus's picture stories, his parables, have basically pointed out over and over again that these religious experts have actually failed in their task. They've failed to be ready for the coming king. They failed to live as those who know and obey him. And they failed to use the gift of his word, which God had invested in them so that they could be a people of his promised blessing. And before Matthew's own Jewish Christian readers could start to feel a bit superior, they would have read also in these chapters that Jesus told his own followers to wait, to watch, to keep awake. Why? Well, because they needed to be careful that the same terrifying judgment and punishment does not fall on them. Too. Now, I don't know if you've seen that advert. I'm not going to um, show it to you because it would be pointless, but there's an advert on the telly. Product placement, by the way, never works for me. I've no idea what the advert is selling, but it's basically a guy in a sandwich shop watching someone making him sandwich, him his sandwich. Um, and he keeps saying to the guy who thinks, surely this sandwich is now big enough. And he just keeps saying, hit me. Hit me. I'll have another layer. Hit me. Um, and Matthew's gospel is a little bit like that. It's rather like a ginormous sandwich um, with five hefty chunks of teaching layered together, one on top of the other. And having these five layers or five sections to his gospel, Matthew's making a real point. He's intentionally placing Jesus's teaching up there on a par with the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. He's saying, when you hear Jesus, you are hearing the very word of God. And as we have seen in recent weeks, this last layer of the sandwich is full of some hot prophetic teaching, all linked by the theme of judgment. And as I've said before, I think this leaves many of us somewhat discomforted. It isn't always easy to preach on either, because let's be honest, many people, even in the church, would rather skip over it. Maybe even wishing Jesus hadn't said these things. And I wonder why. I think there are various reasons why passages like this one are not easy to read, maybe because in part we struggle to accept that there are actual, eternal, spiritual consequences for getting things badly wrong about the things of God. 
or maybe we struggle with passages about judgment because we live in a world where there is always someone else or something else to blame. And so being held responsible for our own actions and their consequences is just not something we really like to feel or think about. Or maybe, and this is quite serious, maybe in the past we have been punished or treated badly for things we never did or had no choice about. So we become ultra sensitive to anything that could be felt as blame or shame. And so we resist it, especially in a world where we are constantly encouraged to feel good about ourselves. And maybe we're uncomfortable about judgment because we also live in a culture where passing judgment is itself judged as judgmentalism. And somewhat hypocritically, I think, the only judgment allowed is that judgment is a bad, bad thing. We quickly learn to be silent about spiritual consequences in the face of these cultural norms. And of course, of course, we also know that Jesus taught that only the one without sin can cast the first stone. And we know that there's plenty enough going on in us that would not stand up to God's close scrutiny. But I think most of all, we find biblical teaching on judgment difficult because we have internalized, thankfully, that God is indeed love. And so we struggle to understand how judgment and eternal punishment on the one hand can be set in the same balance as love. We love our non-Christian friends, colleagues, family and neighbours. So we are really uncomfortable at the idea of them being judged. But like it or not, images of eternal punishment and the end times were unarguably part of Jesus's teaching. And this last layer of the sandwich in Matthew chapters 21 to 25 sits firmly in a long tradition in the Bible of God's judgment. So we do need to be very, very careful here as we look at this particular story. In part, we need to be careful because the story hangs on one quite simple question, really. The story leaves us wondering just who are the sheep and the goats? This is not a stupid question, nor should our response be automatic. Think about it. We started with our silly humorous clip by wondering if it's possible for people to do the right things but for the wrong reasons. Is it even possible to unknowingly gain entry into heaven? In this story, I wonder what happens to the doctrine of salvation through the cross. I was watching a local news item. Some of you may have seen it towards the end of last week. It was about a little girl who had galvanized her whole school into providing clothes and sleeping bags for the homeless on the streets of Southampton. As far as I could tell, though the charity helping distribute the clothing was obviously Christian, the little girl and her family did not seem to be. She simply said, helping the homeless people smile made her smile. 
Does God smile over her? Does God honour those who do the right thing despite not knowing him and never ever bowing the knee before him as king? You see, this is a deceptively simple story of sheep and goats. The mountaintop, if you like, of this set of teaching, the pinnacle, or to use my earlier image, the pickle in the sandwich. It's the last point, the last layer. It's a story that is full of biblical judgment, sorry, biblical imagery of judgment. It's a story, a frightening story of ultimate, final and eternal separation from God. It's a story of divine judgment and divine blessing. It's a story of people who have apparently unknowingly passed the entrance qualification for the kingdom of God. And those who seemingly equally unknowingly discover that they have failed. The sheep and the goats. So, $60 million question we ask ourselves. Are we the sheep? Am I a sheep? Can we relax a bit here? The Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures do make it crystal clear that the people of God, the Jews, are his sheep. For example, Ezekiel um, in chapter 34, I think, speaks of God as shepherd of the sheep of the house of Israel. It also speaks of him dividing them up and separating them out. Jesus builds on this Old Testament teaching himself. And in John's gospel, for example, he tells us, that he's the good shepherd and that his sheep, his followers, interestingly, even from different flocks, all hear his voice. So followers of Jesus, wherever they're from, whether Jew or Gentile, they're all now God's sheep. And of course, in John's gospel, we have this lovely mixed set of related images, Jesus himself is the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, sacrificed for the sin of the world. And yet he is also the shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. So then what about the goats? Is it possible? Am I a goat? Who are the goats? Old Testament scriptures, particularly those that talk about Jewish religious rituals make it really clear that the goat symbolizes a stubborn, repeated, selfish focus representing human sin and disobedience and which results in total separation from, from God. I know that in dream interpretation training and in prophetic revelation training, the goat stands for sin and disobedience and stubbornness and all those things. In Leviticus, we read that on the day of atonement, the priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice and take a goat and confess the entire sins of the people over this poor animal. And then they would quite literally chase it out into the outer wilderness. The goat becoming this dramatic visual symbol of, of being the scapegoat. It's where we get the word from, the scapegoat for the people's sin and their punishment for sin. This is where sin and sinful people belong, enduring an eternity away from the presence of God as a direct result of living without God in their life. In Jesus' story, those who are in are the sheep. Those who are out are the goats. But remember, 
that Jesus has been challenging any idea or suggestion that we are in simply because we belong to the in crowd, simply because we are in the right herd. The Jewish leaders thought that they were in, but Jesus is clear, they were out. We really need to pay close attention to this story because Jesus has now moved on. This is now a story about everybody, not just the religious leaders. At the start of the story, we have this clear statement. All the nations are gathered in before the king of glory. All Jew, Gentile, me, you, believer, non-believer, black, white, women and men. Every single body of every single type and condition and identity, every nationality, every ethnicity, every sexuality, every culture and class of humanity. People who have heard of Jesus, seen him and followed him. People who have heard of Jesus but claim never to have seen him. People who deny Jesus exists and people who have never, ever even heard of Jesus. In a snapshot, in one final moment of time, every single one of us is pictured standing before Jesus, seated on his throne of glory. This is the king we all stand before. And as I hinted at earlier, oh, how this simple story suddenly drops by very difficult here. You see, is Jesus affirming some kind of salvation by works, which we don't agree with. <laughs> if so, if so, those who cannot see the needy in front of them and who simply do nothing about them, could they be you or me? And once again, we find ourselves wondering about the final destination for those who are judged to have failed here. Or are we maybe not so much goats, but are we sheep who strayed? There's a biblical motif there. Are we the sheep who got lost, who would not listen and didn't follow the shepherd? In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says this, and this is terrifyingly difficult to hear. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. And in Luke chapter 6 verse 46, he says this. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Yet, yet are we not his sheep? Those whom, who know that he holds us in his grace? Can Christians who call Jesus Lord, Lord, but fail to be the work, to do the work of his kingdom, really be like goats to be cast into eternal punishment? Or can we be, maybe? in our religious certainty, just like the blind religious leaders of Jesus's day, part of a herd of people convinced of our own salvation and yet who fail to see Jesus in the needy by the roadside and whose failure to act amounts to the handing in of our passport into heaven. It's not so simple after all, is it, this story? We just take one last look at it 
and ask yourself, what really is the difference between the sheep and the goats? The separation, judgment and blessing rests not in who you are or even what you say you believe. Rather, the separation, judgment and blessing rests in what or rather who you see and then what you choose to do about it. The goats are all those who, for whatever reason, did not see Jesus in life. And the end consequence of judgment is that it is this very blindness which will separate them from him forever. You see, the sheep, the sheep are those who see Jesus at work everywhere and especially present in the needs of others. They see the image of God in those who struggle with the falling, fallen realities of earthly life, like the little girl looking at the homeless on the streets of Southampton, in their heart and spirit, they see the distortion of what was originally meant to be. They see this person as made in the image of God. In this person in need, they see a king and his kingdom alternative staring back at them. It does not need to be like this. I can do something to help. The sheep are those who see the need and then they meet it at the point of that need because that is what Jesus does for us and for all humanity. And yes, God smiles. The goats are those who have not simply failed to do the work of the kingdom, but because they failed to act, because they failed to see the fullness of who Jesus is. For this king of glory seated on his heavenly throne is also no stranger to suffering. Scripture teaches that he is close to the brokenhearted, to those who know their need. And that he is the suffering king, the suffering Messiah, crucified for our sin and our selfishness and our failure to look for him. The goats are those who fail to see him, who fail to make his kingdom the focus of their life. The sheep are those who make love for the king the centre of their hearts. It is not about us ever. It is always about him. Sometimes we behave as if we are single-handedly or corporately building his kingdom. This story makes it clear that the kingdom pre-exists us. Jesus has come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before all things were made. To inherit the kingdom is to be amongst those who live life according to kingdom motives, kingdom values, and not our own. This story is a call to deadly serious kingdom hospitality with healing and compassion towards others offered precisely to those who can never pay it back. To be one of his sheep is to join in the work of the one who loved us so much that he gave away all his glory and status in the throne room of heaven to be born 
among us, one of us. This kingdom was brought into being before we were created. And the kingdom is given to the son who, yes, is the king, but he is also the lamb of sacrifice who lived our life and bore on himself the consequences of all our sin. Yes, grace is real. Look at the remaining chapters, perhaps sometime today, of Matthew. Because the remaining chapters of Matthew are an enacted parable. They're a visual reminder of the consequences of sin. What we see in the remaining chapters of Matthew is a real life picture of hell, of separation, of judgment. We see the Lamb of God beaten, whipped, mocked, nailed to a cross and crucified. We see the sins of all nations, the whole world laid upon him, not just the lamb, but the scapegoat. We hear those who thought the kingdom was truly theirs, shower him with insults. We see the weakness of his flesh as he stumbles and as he bleeds. And we hear the utter dereliction in his voice as he experiences the complete abandonment that is hell. My God, my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus takes on himself the ultimate consequence that he has been banging on about for page after page after page of Matthew. He takes hell onto himself, forsaken and abandoned by God because humanity chose to forsake and abandon God themselves. And deep breath, yet, and yet, God's grace in Jesus makes a way for the most selfish of goats and the most self-righteous of sheep to find their way back to their father. This story is the final warning of the one who knows and is about to demonstrate for all time that we are, each one of us, made in the image of the Father, children of the living God and worthy of every effort to reach out and save. This is King Jesus. This is the one who loves us and values us, who takes on himself all that would separate us from him, but who prefers us not to sing, this is me, as if looking in a mirror proudly, so much as, wow, this is him, as we point to the cross with one hand and reach out to the lost with the other. This is a king who says, in as much as you did all these things of the kingdom for the least of all people, you did it for me. So yes, we are amongst his sheep, the sheep 
who know themselves to be saved. We see his truth and we know his power. We are those who have heard the crack of the whip across his back, heard the insults hurled at him as the king of the world was mocked in a dreadful parody of his true identity, even to the point of having a crown of thorns crammed onto his head. We have seen his broken body, his blood. We have heard his anguished cries of despair. How then can we not hear and see him in those whom we are called to serve? And yes, thank God, we are amongst those who have knelt with sheer joy and amazement and relief at the foot of the cross and received his words of forgiveness. We have felt his risen presence. We have been moved by his spirit, yes. We are his sheep. Therefore, fellow sheep, hear this and know this. As sheep, as the sheep of the king, your life can be no longer about what you want Jesus to do for you. It is about what you will do for love of him, our king. Amen.